Today's episode of Hidden Forces is made possible by listeners like you. For more information about this week's episode or for easy access to related programming, visit our website at hiddenforces.io and subscribe to our free email list. If you listen to the show on your Apple Podcast app, remember, you can give us a review. Each review helps more people find the show and join our amazing community. And with that, please enjoy this week's episode. What's up, everybody? My episode today is with a dear old friend who many of you already know from his Hidden Secrets of Money documentaries, which have graced the internet with millions and millions of views each, and in which I've actually made a few appearances in episodes two and eight. There are actually 10 installments so far. It's really an ongoing series, so I'm sure at some point there'll be an episode 11, probably a 12, and so on. But this really is a unique kind of episode because Mike, as I said, is a very good friend and someone I have a lot of history with, both personally and professionally, as well as with his producer, editor, director, Dan Rubach, who actually started the YouTube channel for Mike on a handshake and pretty much worked with him on a handshake for the first few years, which tells you a lot about how Mike does business. And it's really one of the things I love most about him. So I actually wanted to use this as an opportunity for listeners who may already be familiar with Mike to learn about parts of his life, specifically his childhood, his struggles with dyslexia. Most people don't know that Mike hasn't completed high school, that he actually left after the ninth grade and eventually became a traveling salesman driving all over the Southwest and as far north as Oregon with a van full of samples and catalogs of automotive parts and accessories. And then he started a company that manufactured high-end stereo equipment. And again, even fewer people know this, but one of Mike's own designs is on permanent display at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. And I've actually provided a link to the pictures of those designs in the description. So that's just the first chapter of his life. He is the archetypal American entrepreneur, and that's reflected in his management style and I think in his approach to economics, which we also discuss. Mike is a libertarian, an advocate of sound money, so that part of the conversation focuses on his immersion in Austrian economics, why he got into it, and stuff like that. I don't want to say too much. It's a great conversation, so please enjoy. Mr. Mike Maloney, welcome to Hidden Forces. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. This is your inaugural Hidden Forces episode. Yes, but we've known each other for several years now. So, yes, yeah. a long time. So, Mike, yeah. do you have your phone turned off, by the way? Oh, I didn't okay. ask you. I this would... is going to be super informal, which I think is actually part of what's going to be fun about it. It's going to be unusual in that way. I haven't even prepared a rundown for our conversation because I thought this is like two old friends getting together. Yeah. We have known each other for going back to, is it 2011 or beginning of 2012? It's right around that time How did we frame. first meet? Do you remember? <laughs> Capital account. Well, for sure. But do you yeah. remember if it was me just reaching out to you? Yes, I it think was. it was. Yeah. 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 I was like, you're the guy with millions of views online. <laughs> 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 and I, I remember the first interview you did with us was remotely from the LA studio. It was from RT's yeah. LA studio yeah, for sure. Right. I remember because I had that beautiful background. Yeah. Ramon used to- Yeah, I flew into Washington though uh, once you or You did, twi the second twice, time. The second time. Yeah. Maybe twice, but I remember yeah. for sure you came in once where you gave mm -hmm. Lauren and I giant silver coins. Yeah. So that would have been probably in 2013. Yeah. That might have been in New York because we've known each other for a while. Yeah, sorry, yeah. yeah. So where I consider you a good friend. Uh, the first time I was there was in Washington, so- Hey. You sure about that? Uh, maybe. Am I, wrong? <laughs> I don't think so. Okay. I think, well, we'll see. Oh, you well, didn't do we, it from we, Washington. I'm no, sorry. No, we did. No, no, no. The Capital account was from Washington. That was where our studio was. But yeah, we had a I remote remember... studio in LA. And the first time we had you on the program, I'm pretty sure it was from the LA studio. But in any case, yes, yeah. you were definitely in Washington, DC. Yeah. We probably went for drinks, me, you, and Lauren, down yes. to the Brazilian place downstairs, probably. And it seemed like everybody in the place was in politics or they were a lobbyist or something. There wasn't <laughs> anybody in there walking 
walking past any table that you didn't hear them talking about politics. Uh, you noticed that, it's, huh? Yes. You're, you're kind of place. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mike, we're going to, to give the audience a sense of what we're going to discuss, I told you that I'd like to try to explore your background to the extent that we can and give people a more intimate sense of who you are. Mm -hmm. And then there are, of course, really interesting things that we'll be able to discuss. Obviously, we'll discuss economics and the markets. I think from a economic political philosophy standpoint, we might have a very interesting conversation because I think that you know you have a very clear set of ideas there and you've done a lot of work in that area. I know you're working on a book. You can't talk too much about it, but we'll see what we can pry out of you. And also, we'll talk about Tesla because you're a dear friend who owns Tesla many Teslas. And in fact, uh, Tesla has saved your life, if I remember correctly. Yeah. And uh, you have taken some issue with some of the coverage that we've done. So I look forward to giving our audience the views of someone who is an owner and someone who I deeply respect. So Mike, a lot of people know you online. You know, Maybe you can give, for those who don't know you, maybe you can give us a sense of sort of what you're best known for and what you do now. And then maybe we can try to unpack your career and life because it's so interesting. So maybe you could start us off there. Well, I was born in Salem, Oregon, moved to California when I was four years old and uh, had a lot of trouble with school and was always lagging behind. And after a while, I was in all of the remedial classes and my teachers would say things like, you know, you're the smartest kid in the class. Why can't you learn anything? How and old? Another how old were you oh, when this started? That started when I was like seven, eight, nine. Hmm. And, you know, other teachers would actually tell me that I was dumb. And then they uh, actually did say that? Yeah. Yeah. It was one, a kind of... one teacher that said that to my face that I was really? stupid. Yeah. Wow. And uh, how did that make you feel? Pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> but what <laughs> was going on was I was dyslexic and they just couldn't teach me in a method where I could learn. So they were wasting my time. I was wasting theirs. And this was before scientists already knew what dyslexia was, but teachers were not trained to look for it. What time frame are we talking about here? What, this would have what been years? back in the 60s. In the 60s. Uh, you know, and then the early 70s. And then so third month of 10th grade, I left school and I've never been back. So I'm pretty much self-educated. You know, most school teaches you stuff that you don't use during your lifetime anyway. Well, have you seen... <laughs> uh, Father Guido skit on SNL? No, I haven't. It's a, I'm going to be able to do it justice, but he has like a five minute thing for the, all you learn in high school. It's a funny thing. And he has a, a bit there in economics about supply equals demand or something like that. Is it on uh, YouTube? I'll have to look it yeah, up. Yeah, I'll, I'll show it okay. to you afterwards. It's super funny. <laughs> and uh, if I remember, I'll put a link in the description for our okay. listeners. But Obviously, it was a different time then, right? Like, uh, I mean, people- It was. It was a different time. And right. what part of California was it? Well, I lived in Los Angeles, right near the coast, near where Los Angeles Airport is, Playa del Rey, Culver City, Santa Monica. And then the last three years I lived there was in the Malibu Mountains, and that was just beautiful. Wow. Yeah. That's not far from where you used to live. Right. I, I took you through there yeah. when I flew you out there to drive yeah. my Tesla. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. And yeah. yeah, that's a whole other story. We should probably get into that one. That's also great. But uh -huh. before we do, two questions that came up while you were talking, I don't want to forget them. One is, did you have a conversation with your parents about leaving school? I mean, what was that like? I imagine there must have been some friction there. And then also, yeah. what is it like to have dyslexia? Well, it's a curse and a gift, both. Uh, the curse part of it came with trying to get through school where, you know, when teachers would say, open up your books to page so-and-so and read from page this to page that, and then we'll have a test at the end. I was just an F student for you those teachers. Read? But then I would, well, words get scrambled. And then the more pressure you're under, reading out loud was the most embarrassing thing because my mind will actually make up a sentence that makes not sense. There. <laughs> it works for me in my head, but it's actually not on the page. And I'll go along and read and get through a couple of sentences. And then the first word that I would misinterpret, the class would laugh. And from then on, it was oh, just man. like a total train wreck. So it was, it was pretty embarrassing. And uh, I pick up things very quickly. When I got a teacher that just lectured all the time, in seventh grade, I had this teacher, Mr. McCormick, that had been around the world seven times. He was fascinating. And he would just lecture all the time. 
And I suddenly went from a D and F student to the top scoring kid in seven periods of 45 students per class. I was the top scoring. And because in, in, I just in listened high school? and then he gave all the, he read out, read all of the questions. And back then we had these computer cards with these little bubbles that you'd fill in with a pencil that had some real lead in the pencil lead, you know, and then they'd scan them and it would go into a computer and you'd get your results. And so I didn't actually have to read anything or write anything. And suddenly I became the smartest kid instead of the dumbest kid. That should have been a tip off to them that there was something wrong. <laughs> well, so that's, I'm curious about that. When did you have Mr. McCormick? Uh, seventh grade. Seventh grade. Yeah. So, I mean, wasn't that something that, first of all, did that inspire you to question what's the deal here? Why did I do so well in this class? Well, no, I didn't really it's think about it then, you know, but when I went into 10th grade for the first month, the remedial teacher for math was out. So we got the teacher that taught calculus in the all the remedial kids. He had a couple of periods where that he had free. And so all of the remedial kids ended his class and he did the same thing. He just lectured all the time and he taught us all of these shortcuts and stuff. And suddenly math went from something that was just excruciating for me to the most fascinating subject. It was mm. just, and I learned more in that one month than I had in the other nine years about math. Was, Did geometry come easier to you than arithmetic? Yes. Mm. Yeah, I was always like really good at fractions and things. Mm. So. Okay, so you, you had a conversation with your parents. I don't know how that went. My father was actually quite supportive because he only made it to sixth grade. <laughs> <laughs> so you already- But he was a very successful businessman. Uh. So he was supportive, but then when I did leave school, he said, well, you're not gonna sit around here on the couch. And so for my 17th birthday, I got a uh, Chevy van full of samples and a bunch of catalogs. And he said, congratulations, kid. You're a traveling salesman. Hit the road. <laughs> oh, wow. This is where the story begins. That's really cool. I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh, samples so I've been of working what? since samples I was Samples of what? I had mini bikes and go-karts and we were a manufacturer's representative firm for performance goodies. So Your all father's this company? Hot, Your yeah, father, okay. Yeah. So the, all this hot rod equipment and chrome accessories and my job as a 17 year old kid was to cover all the territories that all of the real salesmen didn't have, that they didn't want. So mm -hmm. I got all the small towns, but it was great. I drove almost a hundred thousand miles the first year that I was driving. Where did you go? I covered California, Nevada, and Arizona. Wow. And <laughs> when you got to Santa Barbara, the highway used to, the freeway used to drop down and you had a series of traffic lights that went for about a mile and a half, two miles. And all of the hitchhikers got dropped off there. And I would go through and just clean off the whole north, you know, whichever direction I was going, clean off the whole northbound side of the street. Twice I picked up 13 hitchhikers. And uh, once I took four of them all the way to Medford, Oregon, another time two of them. From California? you took From them Santa Barbara, from Southern California to Medford, Oregon. Wow. Doing things like, you know... I only got paid like a hundred bucks a week. Did you have to cover your own gas? No, I had an expense account. So the first thing I would do is take everybody out for beer and pizza. <laughs> it was- it That was, sounds like so great. much fun. It was fun. You know, I just had to stop at all of the, you know, all the small towns, the motorcycle shops, the auto accessory stores and all of that stuff and give them catalogs. And then I became the one in the company that when there was a question that any salesman had, I was the guy that everybody asked. And if they had an account that was real technical, they would bring me in to explain all of the uh, performance equipment, how it worked and why it was better than the competition. Hmm. So what do you think made you so successful? I mean, it's one thing to understand the equipment, to understand the technology, and it's another thing to be able to sell it, right? Because of the dyslexia, one of the things that dyslexia also did for me is I can look at charts and see things in them that everybody else misses. Mm. And I also know how it relates to another chart that I saw three years ago. But it gave me the ability to explain things to people that are complex subjects in a very simple manner. Mm. This training of trying to explain superchargers and limited slip differentials and things like, you know, we represented Hearst shifters and Excel plug wires and general electric silicones and just this huge range of products. And I had to explain 
how they worked, why they were better than the competition, and why they should buy them. So how did you go from auto engineering to audio engineering? Well, the audio engineering was like a hobby. I built a set of speakers when I was about 18. Then people would want their car stereos upgraded or for me to build them a, a set of speakers. And I really didn't enjoy doing the manufacturer's representative stuff. By that point, I had my own manufacturer's representative firm covering California, Nevada, Arizona. And I had four other people working for me. I had offices in Did you branch Phoenix off or were you still working Diego under your father's company? I had branched off. Branched my off. father had sold his company ah. and uh, I started my own in the same sector. I was in my 20s then and I had been doing the stereo equipment in, as a hobby and I ended up starting a legitimate stereo manufacturing company and I made some designs that when in the, I think 1989, 1990, the curator from the Queen Victoria Prince Albert Museum in London, which is one of the finest design museums in the world, saw my amplifiers on the cover of International Design Magazine and wrote me asking me to donate a pair. And I told them, you know, we're a tiny little company. I can't really afford to do that, but they can have them at cost. <laughs> <laughs> and so they bought a set and they picked five examples from around the world, industrial design. And I was one of the five artists that they picked for permanent display. My stuff never gets rotated down into the basement. So it was, That's so it was quite an honor. Do pe I won can a lot people of see that online? Yeah. Is there a link to that? You know, I'm going to have to put them Try on the- Try and find me one. I'll put one in the description. I'll put them on the About Me page on the goldsilver.com okay. website. So okay. yeah, I'll get those pictures up there. Yeah, yeah. Cool. How did you learn to do that? I just had friends that were into it and I had been designing speakers. And like I said, the dyslexia actually helps me. It helps me picture electric. I can visualize electrical flow on a circuit board or in a loudspeaker crossover and such. I got really good at doing crossovers on, you know, speakers that have tweeters, mid ranges and woofers, you know, when you want to separate the different frequencies of sound. I got very intuitive on that. I actually had competitions with friends that would do them with all the computer programs and I'd just start going and clipping on coils and capacitors and resistors and come up with something that actually measured better than what they came out with and sounded better. So you didn't stick with that for very long? I mean, how long did you stick with that? And I did it in the 80s and early 90s and then the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas, the CES, mm -hmm. uh, some people may know it as, when it came to the high-end audio portion, which is really what started the Consumer Electronics Show, they were paying less and less attention to it. And it was getting more and more expensive with a lower and lower level of service. And so I started a competing show called the Home Entertainment Show. And that was actually more successful than my was it TV? company. No, this was a trade show oh, in God. Las Vegas, the same hours as the Consumer Electronics Show, the same Get out of dates, here. I didn't know that. And I started stealing away a whole lot of their business. We had about 300 manufacturers. What I would do is buy an entire hotel for 10 days and have them remove the beds and some of the furnishings from all the rooms. And then the rooms were sold as exhibits and manufacturers would come in from all over the world and set up their stereo systems and their home theater systems. In the rooms and, because the rooms were replicas basically of their homes. Yes. And it's separate. It wasn't like trying to demonstrate something on a convention Had you seen that done anywhere where else? you've got all the noise from all the other booths. Had so, you seen that done anywhere else? Or uh, did you well, just think CES it, it had yourself? done that for their high-end audio section, but they had a really ignored ignored it. It became like an appendage, that, wow. that something they really didn't care about. So how long and did you so, do that for? From 1999, and I gave my shares to my business partner in 2005 when I started up goldsilver.com. But the show kept on going until I believe last year. I think they've closed it down now. I'm not sure. That's fascinating. So you had um, this whole career. I mean, so you started as a traveling salesman. Yeah. <laughs> traveling salesman, electronics engineer, and you know, when I was doing scientific fidelity, sci-fi for short, yeah. there I was the engineer, production manager. You know, when you start- That was the name of the company? Sci-fi was the name of the company? Yeah. Really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you've seen my designs. Actually- Your designs uh, are beautiful. I was, that was 1984. Yeah, that's why I want people to see just them. won awards all over the place. I was the very first one to take, you know, we had vacuum tube amplifiers. And back then, high-end audio equipment, if it was electronic- 
it had a rack mount plate on it. You've got some rack mount equipment here in the studio. That system was developed for American Telegraph Company. So this is really for the telegraph system, this standardized rack mount system. And it worked its way into the scientific community. And one day back in the 40s, somebody took a scientific amplifier out of the rack, put it on the floor in their living room and hooked it up to a loudspeaker wow. and it sounded good. That became high-end wow. audio. And <laughs> even today, a whole lot of high-end audio looks like rack mount equipment. So it was just, you know, people sort of develop a sense of design. They develop eyes that see things as beautiful because they're used to seeing the, for instance, I don't like Rolexes. I think they look mm. industrial. Mm. I've never liked them. I have this unreasonable hatred of SUVs. <laughs> and everybody <laughs> loves SUVs, but I always like to pretend that I just landed here from another planet and I'm looking at things for the first time and see That's whether so the true design about aesthetics. You. That's so true about um, you. Yeah. Vacuum tube amps back then were in this perforated cage of metal and they had speaker cables connected to the back of them and the input cables connected to the front of so you had this thing on the floor that looked like a heater with cables going to it and i took the vacuum tubes which are beautiful by the way vacuum mm. tubes they've got these heaters in them that glow these orange colors and then if the tube is slightly gassy it develops a corona that sticks to the glass and that corona flickers with the bass note. It'll shrink when there's a heavy current draw from the amp. And so I took them out of the cage and held them out like art. And now everybody does that. So wow. I sort of set a, a standard. An aesthetic. For that was an aesthetic, aesthetic decision. design standard. You know, you're then. making me want to learn about this stuff and do an episode on it. Because I, I remember growing up that my dad was a huge audiophile. And I know from him that it was, and I believe this was generally true, it was audio equipment, like you said, was a big deal in the 70s and 80s, right? But then it began to mm -hmm. fall off in the 90s, I guess, maybe with home theater systems where everyone started watching big plasma TVs and there was That's a shift. That's part of it. And it's also a shift from- when, Records. Well, yeah. It's going from like LPs where this experience where you'd open up this LP and there's all this real estate that would print the words on it and print images and there were booklets in them and stuff to CDs and then as we went to iPods and stuff yeah, and ear, the ear, earphones, too. it became much less of, you know, when I was a kid, we'd have a party and sit in the dark and play the Beatles revolution number nine backwards and stuff <laughs> on a turntable trying to hear, you know, the Beatles back then buried all these clues. There, there was this big hoax that Paul was dead <laughs> and it was a great publicity stunt because the Stones had become very popular. And they did this over a period of years. They planted all these clues and then people started discovering them. And in the meantime, Paul had married Linda Eastman and they were living in a castle somewhere. And, you know, it was you quite, know, and when they discovered that Paul wasn't dead, I mean, it made the cover of Life magazine. You know, this would make a really interesting episode. I did one episode early on episode four on the history of American television and the history of America through television. And I'm fascinated by this sort of stuff. I mean, you mm -hmm. know, you're talking about something where the experience was communal, the technology was compatible with communal experiences. And then you had this shift to things like the Walkman where people began to have private experiences. Yeah. It's fascinating to consider how technology interoperates with culture and how it changes society, right? Yeah. You know, music now we see everyone is changing walking right around. now because of Spotify. They've got to hook the listener in the first 20 seconds and then the music has to be a certain minute and a half to three minutes is what they're looking for. Yeah. And so people are like in a competition to try and get their stuff on Spotify and popular. And so economics has so much to do with our tastes. And, uh, you know, classical music came from an era where a king of one country was trying to outdo a king of another country. And the symphonies were basically command performances. And they would try and get the best musicians and the best composers. And they were basically on the payroll of the government. Mm. And so that's how you were able to pay 120 musicians. You know, as time progressed, you get into like big band swing. When Dixie jazz came about, there you're talking about a small combo in a bar. 
But as dance halls developed and you were trying to fill a place that had a thousand or two thousand people, how do you fill that? Well, you have to have five saxophones, four trombones, and five trumpets. The drums are plenty loud. You don't have to worry about them. And now you can play chords. So now you get this richness that goes along with it. But then how many more drinks does a place have to sell to make the profit to pay all those musicians? It's a really tough deal. And so then you get the smaller jazz combos and then rock and roll combos. And it was it's much easier for a bar to play a... Uh, three-piece jazz or blues combo, and then rock and roll came in, and now we have DJs. And so it's very rare to actually see live music. And so the economics of the situation, how many more drinks does a yeah. place have to sell to cover the band, is what determines what your taste is going to be. That's fascinating. That's a really great point. And that's actually something for the television episode we discussed, the economics of television, and how the economics is yeah. the reason why there were 30-minute shows because they could go into syndication, for example. The syndication of programming influenced what type of programming or the dimensions of the mm -hmm. of the program. So how did all this, so here you are, you, you were a traveling sales, you're an entrepreneur, basically. You're a, a guy who- Yeah, I've had numerous businesses. And you were successful in audio engineering. How did you go from that life to starting Gold Silver? What was that connection? When my father died, he left an estate that should have taken care of my mother for the rest of her life. But in 1999, the broker that my father had always used, that we were still with, was saying, you know, I just don't understand these markets these days. Now, that made us worry that he didn't understand it. In hindsight, I realized, you know, the NASDAQ is going into a blow-off top. Everything has gotten crazy. He was saying that nobody is He was saying, I don't buying... know what to buy. Right. PE ratios, all of the things, there was no value right. in anything. They were just insane prices and everything was going north at this incredible rate. And that's what he didn't understand. But we just took it as he didn't really understand what he was doing anymore. Hmm. And so we found a financial planner and interviewed a whole bunch of them, like a dozen, picked the one with the best testimonials and stuff, gave him control of the estate. And he lost more than half of it in the next couple of years. And every six months we'd have a meeting and he'd come smiling over to the, my mother's house and, and say, well, we did really well. The uh, S&P lost 24% and you only lost 18. <laughs> because she was more heavily invested in bonds because of her age? He had her in these low risk stocks. And so, yeah. you know, low beta. And, low beta uh, exposure. Yeah. And when he had lost more than half her portfolio, I ripped the thing away from him, moved everything to cash and started studying the markets. And you can't study the markets without studying the economy because they affect each other very heavily. And when you start studying the economy, you can't study the US economy in isolation. You have to study the global economy. And when you study the global economy, you find that there's a certain crowd out there that's very concerned with international trade flows and deficits and so on. And that tends to be the hard money advocates, the precious metals community. And when you study the precious metals community, now you go down this rabbit hole of monetary history and how it all always repeats. And I was just absolutely fascinated with this. I would study it every single day after work and then all day long on Saturdays and Sundays, I'd just do nothing but. What fascinated you about it? Uh, well, when I saw monetary history and how it repeats, but with little twists, it's never the same, but it's- So you're, you were reading a, books on audiobook. How were you um, digesting this material? Well, in about the year 2000, when uh, Steve Jobs came out with OS X, built into the operating system was text-to-speech software. And then a couple of years later, I found out that they had dictation software built into the operating system also. So the world of books opened up to me suddenly just when I needed it. Hmm. And then I would have my assistant or somebody at the company, I bought a duplexing scanner. I'd buy Milton Friedman's Monetary History of the United States and have them take it down to the bookstore, slice the binding off, run it through the duplexing scanner, run it through optical character recognition to text software and print out PDFs of the book for me so that I could have the Mac Crazy. read Crazy. What yeah. books did you read during this time? So you read, oh. you read Friedman and Schwartz. You read yeah, what else? Well, for instance, there's like 18 pages of the Great Depression 
in my book, The Guide to Investing in Gold and Silver. And to write that, I read Milton Friedman's Monetary History of the United States because he's a monetarist. I wanted right. points of view well, also from book. each different major sector of economic thought. So that book, which is like, what is that? It's close to 2,000 pages, isn't it? I think it's 1,000 pages. It's thicker than Atlas Shrugged, and that's 1,078 pages. Maybe it's like 1,200 pages yeah, or something yeah. like yeah, that. Yeah, actually, I think it's 1,400, but there's a lot of citations. And then I read Murray Rothbard's America's Great Depression. So there you get the Austrian perspective, which, by the way, is a great book. And then I read Ben Bernanke's Essays on the Great Depression so that I had a Keynesian perspective. So monetarist, Austrian, and Keynesian perspective. Mm. And it was fascinating. Ben Bernanke is a really bad author and it just <laughs> gives you a headache. So if you get, ever get the opportunity to read it, don't. But So what uh, were the, the three different theses? What was Milton Friedman's thesis on why we had the Great Depression? That it was what, the Federal was... Reserve's fault and it would have just been nothing but a, a deep recession that would have lasted a year or two had we let the free market work. What's really interesting, Milton Friedman, you know, he was writing the monetary history of the United States, so he covered it all. Murray Rothbard, America's Great Depression, he covers the 20s and he goes up to 1930 when the depression starts. And then he builds his case that the depression was the total result of the Federal Reserve manipulating the free market throughout the 20s and causing the bubble mm. that then caused the crash. And then Hoover actually started all of the economic policies that Roosevelt sort of institutionalized that became ingrained in our society that actually extended the cause, the great recession to become the great depression mm -hmm. by redistributing wealth. When, you know, my favorite hotel in the world probably is the Timberline Lodge up on Mount Hood, Oregon. And this lodge that was built by one of the programs that Roosevelt started in the great depression and uh, the WPA or whatever it is. And Roosevelt was there to inaugurate it. And what they did was they're taxing productive businesses. And then they take a bunch of basically, you know, they called them hobos then, but homeless people right. off mm -hmm. the streets, put them up on this mountain up at, you know, 5,000 feet, 6,000 feet up. And they're doing things like weaving their own cloth, hand pounding their own nails, and they build this beautiful thing with all these carvings in it. And so it's, it's just a wonderful place. But they're taxing a business that makes nails efficiently <sighs> to pay somebody that makes nails inefficiently right. just to give them a job. And some of those businesses that they taxed ended up going out of business. Hmm. I took these three books, put them in a timeline. But what's interesting is Murray Rothbard proved his case that this is what caused the Great Depression. Ben Bernanke ignores all of that and starts his book in the midst of the Great Depression in 1930 and goes on from there. He doesn't deal with any of what caused it to happen in the first place. Mm. And this is his big thesis that got him nominated for the chairman of the Federal Reserve. So, Well, the, one of the common views that emerged from the end of the Great Depression was that it was a crisis of demand that there was insufficient demand and the theories were yeah. that the government needed to enact fiscal spending in order to generate the demand required to get the economy right, restarted but the government, again. The government doesn't produce anything. Right. So you have to take it from somewhere else in the real economy, run it through the government, which is frictional because you've got a bunch of government employees that need to be paid. And then you put it back into the economy, but you're always putting less into the economy than you took out. No matter what you do, there is no way that you can look at it. It's not a perpetual motion machine. Yeah. Well, I don't remember what the theory was exactly now, I'm blanking on it, that we were taught in school, but it wasn't focused right. on the textbooks that we had that we used to learn economics in college. None of them talked about the Great Depression in terms of debt. In fact, liabilities, monetary policy, money, credit, that was totally absent from my macroeconomic courses. Right. The Great Depression was explained simply in terms of this paradox of thrift. Right? That was the term. It was the paradox of thrift. It was that all of a sudden the economy tips into a place where everyone wants to save, no one wants to spend. So the government has to step in in order to be the spender of last resort. And you know, it misses this whole other part of the equation, which of course Rothbard talked about and which Friedman was dealing with to some degree with his point around monetary policy. So you read these three books 
And well, these three books, when you stack them up, there it's about six inches, I guess. Yeah, of, of like a, so high. Th and three that became of that is, uh, eighteen Friedman. pages of of my book. So mm -hmm. that I suppose when it comes to economics, I've read a stack of books that's at least four feet high. Mm. So, so the first book you wrote was what? Was that the rich? Was that guide rich to investing in gold and silver? The rich dad. Right. Book. When yeah. did that come out? That was actually in July of 2008 that it hit Amazon. So you started buying gold and silver, precious and metals it, when? It sort of predicted the crisis of 2008 in the book, mm. which happened just like a couple of months after the book was available. If you were public. reading Austrian, th I mean, I think our views, well, I'm not sure. Maybe our views are very closely aligned. I think they may, they may diverge a little bit in that... I definitely think Austrian theory is invaluable, as I'm about to explain, but I think I have a more nuanced view than I used to have. I used to have a much more like total view with purest view. More macro view. view. Purest okay. view. No, purest okay. view on everything. And I can explain because I, I see things now with more of a political lens. But I mean, anyone that was studying Austrian theory during that period would have been able to foresee the credit crisis not all the specifics of it, but on the macro level, they'd be, been able to. And I think that was a, a big reason for the popularity of Austrian economics coming out of the crisis, right? Because so many of the Austrians got that part of it right. Now, a lot of them got a big part of it wrong, which was right. the hyperinflation. Guys but like that Peter is Schiff, really where example. Keynesian economics was launched in the midst of the Great Depression. John Maynard Keynes's uh, great paper, was it 32 or 34 that he... Wrote. Well, I think though the so well, I was saying that during the financial crisis of two thousand and eight, after that, a lot of these Austrian theories got a oh. lot of popularity. Oh yes. But, well, what I am, I'm sorry. But, but I would, but I, but I would, okay. but I would suggest though that I think there is. This brings it to the nuance. I think, I think that there was a political crisis in the country during the nineteen thirties, and I think that a lot of times Austrians, when they think about things purely in terms of what is the most efficient way to get from point A to point B, which is let's say have a liquidation, you know, yes. have a full liquidation, let the market clear, and then starting you, I think that what's often missed in those types of situations is the political instability that, that can generate, and that can be overall detrimental to the economy more so than the inefficiencies that are born out of trying to manage the deflation, trying to manage the contraction, right? A managed deleveraging. Do you ever think about that? Like the political consequences? Of Whenever we've let them manage it though, they cause a bubble that then <laughs> pops and we have this sudden, at least it's trying to deflate, the economy is. You mentioned people getting scared and pulling back on spending. That cycle is the velocity of currency how many times a unit of currency changes hands in a year. And that's always going to be with us. That the, it, I call it, uh, it's cycle logical. It happens in waves and cycles. Mm. And it's, it's uh, sort of logical that it does this. People get scared. They start, you know, some event, trigger event will cause people to spend less. And then suddenly the that's economy the takes cycle. a downturn. But if you leave it alone, it comes back and then these cycles used to happen on a very regular basis and they weren't as deep as they are now. Yeah. Now we have the Federal Reserve comes to the rescue and their manipulations that they create set us up for the next big crash. And the more they manipulate, the bigger the crash gets. And that's what we've been seeing, especially this century. Alan Greenspan manipulated things. He was afraid of the Y2K bug, remember that? Yeah, no, he, he was, and he added a bunch of liquidity to the market. And, and coincidentally, the NASDAQ went vertical those same months that he was adding yeah. all that liquidity. And then when they pulled out that liquidity, the markets crashed. And then he lowers interest rates down to 1% to levitate the markets again. Yeah. And off to the side, out of his peripheral vision, he didn't see it, but he created this giant real estate Well, bubble. how much do you think is the actual open market operations and the liquidity that's created by purchasing securities in the open market by the Fed? And how much of it is the all the other factors, including the way in which central bankers try and manage confidence? And so you're talking about the 2001 yeah. period. There was also the Bush administration coming out and saying, go ahead and spend, everything's going to be okay. And the same thing also, I think, you know, with you know, forward I guidance today, quickly, how much of it is the psychological management that central banks do? I think, it, you know, it used to be that recessions would happen about every four years. And it's better to have a small recession every four years than, than this giant crisis every 10. 
because with the smaller recessions, people just go, they know that we're going to come out of it. They remember one just a few years back. But when you have these giant economic crises, they want somebody to do something about it. The next crisis that we have is going to be their Bernanke bust. It will be something that is direct result of the energy that is stored by Ben Bernanke warping the economy when he took interest rates down to zero and created, central banks around the world created, too. Yeah. Created th- we went from zero point eight three trillion, eight hundred and thirty billion to 4.4 trillion was where base currency peaked Yeah, that at. was crazy. So, right. So we're talking that's about one of the ma- scariest, creating That's actually one of the point- scariest graphs in the world when you look at base money. It is. Now, most of that is sitting on banks' balance sheets as excess reserves. But here's something, you know, people are screaming about wealth, income inequality, wealth disparity. These are the big words of the day. And when I look at it, what I see is, you know, I did a study on this and it's in my upcoming book and I can disclose it because I've already shown this to people many times in videos and stuff. I've been showing it actually since shortly after QE1. So it goes back to 2009, 2010, I think, that I've been showing the correlation between the growth of the base currency supply and the value of the stock market, the Wilshire 5000 total market cap index. And from December of 2008 to December of 2015, there is a 0.976 correlation. So that that means that it was uncorrelated only 2.4. So it's a 97.6% probability that these two are connected somehow, that the growth of base currency caused the stock market to rise and 2.4% probability that it's an accident, that it's just a coincidence. Now, let me finish this though. If you tax people or indebt them in the future by issuing bonds and the Federal Reserve buys them to create currency and they buy them from the big brokerage houses, that's the primary dealers that get to show up at the treasury auctions that are sitting on bonds. The Fed never buys them directly from the treasury. They buy them from the primary dealers. So it's Merrill Lynch and Goldman Sachs and entities like that, that end up with this brand new currency that was just created to purchase that asset. And so that goes on their books as excess reserves. And there's a direct correlation to how much currency the Federal Reserve creates and gives them as far as the rise of the stock market. It's a 97.6% correlation. Now, if you cause the stock markets to rise and the it's the big tech stocks and so on, the FANGs, the mm-hmm. Facebook, Amazon, Google, Netflix, Apple, that have had most of the rise in the stock market. And so Jeff Bezos, who has 16% of Amazon, goes from having $50 billion to having $130 billion. Yeah. So it's a direct gift of taxing Main Street. It's a reverse Robin Hood. The Federal so Reserve so is taxing is. Main Street yeah. and bestowing that wealth on the richest people on the planet. And now everybody's up in arms against this wealth disparity and they don't realize it's not capitalism that's causing it. It's not the free market that's causing it. It's this manipulation by the Federal Reserve doing this reverse Robin Hood, stealing from the poor and giving to the rich. And then it's also cronyism in Washington, all of the lobbyists being able to get special laws passed for their industries that they're protecting. Right. So a lot of things, right, though, Mike? I mean, definitely the monetary policy is a huge part of it. But yeah. so, for example, is globalization. And so yes. is the information revolution. The fact that companies like Instagram get bought out for X number of billions the same year that Kodak goes bankrupt. Kodak had way many more employees than Instagram had, right? Yeah, it's unbelievable, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it is. But it's sort of the nature of the system. And yeah. are you familiar with a book called The Storm Before the Storm? No. I'm reading it now on someone's recommendation, and it is really fascinating. It's a history of the Roman Republic before the official period where you know the Republic began to fall. It was- the Republic, not the Empire. It's the Republic. So, the so it's the beginning. It's Rome. kind of the, yeah. it's, the subtitle, I think, is the beginning of the fall of the Roman Republic. And I'm just early on in, in reading the book, but it's really fascinating because you can see so many parallels. And I think one of the big parallels is this, this phenomenon where, and part of this is also because of how we measure success in America in particular. Like America is mm-hmm. particularly prone to this. And we measure it in terms of gross domestic product, right? We measure it in terms of GDP primarily. 
But what that doesn't capture, among other things, is it doesn't capture the gross structural inequalities of wealth distribution. And how does that impact politics, right? Because our democratic republic is set up, it's a democracy, right? And so if the, well, if we're the supposed voters- to have a- uh... Uh, it's a representative rep- democracy, yeah, but right, yeah, right. But what I'm saying is, though, there is a it's place a, it's for a the republic, yeah, right. But there is a place for the demos, and the demos is becoming increasingly disenfranchised. And I think it's not a coincidence that you're seeing a rise of populism because populism is basically what is it? It's when politicians appeal directly to the masses, right? Mm-hmm. And I think the masses in this case are increasingly disenfranchised. This is what scares me because the masses aren't analyzing the economics of the situation and politicians will always promise more free stuff than their But how their do we deal with this thing though, right? There's a real so. problem here, right? Because like, let's say guys like you and me work honestly, we work hard mm-hmm. and we've played by the rules and we've earned according to the rules what we are owed. How do we disentangle the fact that there are folks like you and me, but then there are lots of other people that have made billions of dollars, right? And mm-hmm. benefited from these programs and everything else for regulations and whatever else. How do we fix this problem of inequality, which in my contention is it's unworkable. We're going to hit a wall. We are. How do we fix that with doing the minimum amount of damage to people that have worked and played by the rules, right? Mm -hmm. And then those who have basically stolen, whether directly or indirectly, or benefited from, you know, lobbyists and regulations that, that work in their favor from decades of accumulating billions of dollars. I mean, nowhere was this more obvious than in on Wall Street, where mm-hmm. so much of it was extractive, right? How do you disentangle that? Because I feel like there's no clear way to do it, and there are going to be so many people, let's say, who get punished, who don't deserve to get punished, and so many people that get away with it. I think there's two ways of doing it. One is not going to happen, and that is to start dismantling laws and regulations one after another as quickly as possible and doing away. One of the things that causes the big wealth disparity is fractional reserve lending and central banking. Creating currency from nothing is one of the methods of transferring wealth from one group of people to another. And it's almost invisible. It's very difficult. The average person, you know, one of the things that we do with our video series, Hidden Secrets of Money, which is free on YouTube, there's 10 of them now, is to try and explain complex economic processes with animations and make it so that people can understand it. By the way, episodes nine and 10 were all shot in Rome and they're all the parallels of the Roman Republic and the Roman Empire to the United States today. And it is fascinating. Mm. So if you haven't seen that one yet, those two episodes, I've got two animators and these guys worked for probably a year and a half. Aiden is one of them, right? Aiden and Lincoln, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And Dan is the producer, director. Uh, He does the scoring and the sound and lighting and everything, basically. He even does some of the storyline. But that one is worth big screen TV and a bowl of popcorn. (laughs) (laughs) But... You were going on to the politics. How do we unwind? You can get rid of regulation or the other one, it goes the direction it goes that's not until there's solve a the, total collapse. But that's not going to solve the But what I'm saying though, Mike, is- It, uh, it will eventually solve but, it. But if, that, if you don't have these wealth transfers, you won't have the income inequality that you have to the extremes that it exists today. Right. But what I'm saying is that for the foreseeable future, it's not right. going to resolve the problem, right? Like this is a long-term It's long not going to happen. Solution. We're just not going to vote for that. What do you mean? Oh, you're saying politically it's not palatable. Po- politically, it's right. not palatable. Well, so what's uh, yeah. going to happen is it goes on the course that saying, it's on until things, yeah. you know, you but do saying, have a reset eventually. The USSR collapsed, it reset, and it came out of it, a much more free market capitalist society, even though they do have, it's all being run it's under oligarchs. Corrupt. It's super corrupt. It is super corrupt. But if you're there talking, it's like in China. That's also corrupt. But if you're there talking to a small businessman, that is the wild, wild west of capitalism in China. Yeah. Well, I mean, okay, but I would say that anecdotes, uh, I'm thinking of this woman named Svetlana Alexievich. I read pieces of a book that she wrote, which was an oral history of people living in the post-USSR. And I've read some stuff by Andrew Solomon as well about his time in the Soviet Union during Glasnost and during the collapse where he was spending a lot of time with local artists and it was 
a really fascinating story because these Soviet artists were somewhat shocked by the pricing of their art, where the works in certain instances of artists who were revered sold for practically nothing, while what were essentially decorative paintings by OK artists reached astronomical prices. And so they were, in effect, traumatized by the pricing of their art. Mm -hmm. They had never had their art priced before. It's fascinating, yeah. right? Because in America... And there's another for listeners, there's a really great documentary on this called The Price of Everything. Right. Which is, well, under the communist system, the government was their only customer. <laughs> well, no, they had, I don't know exactly how it worked exactly, but I mean, the point is that there was a different system by which art was valued. Uh -huh. It may not have even been about pricing, right? It might not have even been about like governments or sales or anything. It's just that they had a different way of valuing it. And I think- I think the USSR, the collapse of the USSR, and I'm not the best to speak about this, is an interesting place to study what happens when a country goes from being highly repressed, its economy repressed, and with a very authoritarian government, to basically having those walls just torn down, right. right? And having markets introduced rather violently into the country. And I think that was- Well, this going to happen in Venezuela very soon too. Anytime a government promises to take care of every need of everybody- the end result is a lot of poverty and death and then a revolution. But do the you whole think, so, falls what apart. Is your, so what is your view about the role of government? Like, what do you think the ideal government would be? Well, you know, Milton Friedman said it, the government's job is basically to protect us and set a fair set of playing rules for the game. So you can prove with data, if you go to the Fraser Institute in Canada, you know, there's other think tanks that come to the same conclusions. I don't like to use them because they tend to be con U.S. conservative think tanks. And mm -hmm. when I, if I say their name, then people, well, that's just a conservative. It's Cato Institute. But you, <laughs> yeah. Cato Heritage Foundation, right. stuff like that. If you use Fraser Institute up in Canada, now you're talking about a moderate Canadian thing, but they have the Freedom of the World report annually. And they've been auditing any country that produces reliable economic data since I believe 1966. It started out with 16 or 18 countries, but now it's 157 countries that they collect data on. And they're measuring things like the size of the government compared to the GDP, the levels of the taxation, the court system, the lack of corruption, and the amount of property rights. You know, Do they have really strong property rights? That's a key factor in prosperity in a country. The soundness of their currency, do they debase the currency or do they keep it sound? The economic freedom, the ability to go anywhere in the world, import, export, buy, sell, invest in, and bring home the proceeds of anything without the government charging big duties or putting in trade barriers or, or things like this. And then regulation of the financial markets, the labor markets, but especially small business. If you overregulate small business, you just crush prosperity. They put all these things in a spreadsheet. Now, some of them are subjective where you have to sort of give it a rating. But when you're measuring 157 countries, it's pretty easy to say, well, this one's a six out of 10. This one's an eight out of 10. North Korea is zero out of 10. You know, you can give those a rating. Others, it's really hard data. You put these things into a spreadsheet and you hit sort and an amazing thing happens. The countries that go to the top of the list, the people live almost 20 years longer. They're happier. They live in cleaner environments. There's no pollution or child labor laws, child labor problems. It just goes on and on and on. They have better lives, the freer that they are. And then the more vehemently the court system protects their property rights, but without the government guaranteeing that we're going to take care of everybody and they just have to make everything fair. And then once they've made it fair and they said, we're going to protect you from bodily harm with the police, we're going to protect you from foreign invasion with the armed forces, and we're going to protect you from fraud and other things with the court system. Once they do that, and then they just say, okay, have at it, you can all compete, then you end up with the society that is the most prosperous. And when you look at this, Hong Kong and Singapore have been at the top of the list for many years. We hit number two the United States, I believe back in 2000. And then we passed the Patriot Act and started falling very rapidly, which is very concerning because the lower down on this list, the chances are that you're not going to live as long and your children definitely won't live as long. So if you want your children to have longer, happier lives, what you want is maximum freedom 
and the fairest playing field, the fairest set of laws. But Singapore is not a very free country, but before you even comment on that- Economically, they're the most free now. Right. They have more millionaires per capita adjusted for purchasing power parity than any other society on the planet. Yeah. I mean, so let me play a devil's advocate on the regulatory front, specifically with a pollution. You said pollution goes down, but you could argue that the late 1800s were a much freer period in America. I mean, in, in that case, we didn't have any type of environmental regulations. How is the market supposed to regulate economic externalities or the, let's say, it is in the economic interest of a company to pollute an estuary. It's in its own personal self-interest. It's in the self-interest of every single company to do that. How do you prevent that from happening without regulation? I don't have all of the answers for everything. I don't pretend to, and I don't want to be the one to try and come but up with solutions. But do you think the, there is nuance solutions. there? But, well, I do think that today with social media and stuff, if a company is found to be a bad citizen and it gets publicized, people avoid their products. It doesn't require the government nearly as much to punish a company. I mean, when I do a search for restaurants on you know, just Google Maps, I do uh, restaurants and up come the restaurants in my area and you click on them and you see what their star rating is. But that's a perfect example though, because those are highly manipulated. Google and Yelp highly manipulate the curation of ratings. Okay. Well, that's one of the things that blockchain, you know, do you know much about EOS? No, I don't. Dan keeps telling me about okay. it. Okay. <laughs> well, they're launching things like voice, which will be a direct competition to YouTube, Facebook. Yeah. And as blockchain starts taking over this space and we end up with alternatives to Google and Facebook that can't be manipulated. It's an algorithm that is controlled by the users. So, you know, this is all going to happen within the next few years. You know, you've been doing episodes on Hashgraph. Hashgraph and EOS have the possibility of becoming the rails of the internet. You know, the thing that the internet runs on. And these are the only two cryptos that I've seen that could actually do things like run the power grid, run the traffic light system, you know, to time things and get traffic moving better, run all of the power plants, the dams, and do things like secure email and all of your interactions with websites and so on. So I think we've got a good future coming that way. And when getting back to the question, you know, how do you, the problem of the commons has always been the tragedy of the commons, where when you've got something that everybody can use, people will try and use as much of it as they can and not take care of it and maintain it in a sustainable way. And that can be solved by all of the end users, the people that get to do ratings and be able to write articles and say things about the company, swaying people's opinions, because I don't know about you, but advertising doesn't hold much sway for me anymore. It's reviews and YouTube and articles. See, the thing that... though, I think just generally speaking, I think I have a more nuanced view of this and it's evolved over the years. After the 2008 crisis, I became a strident. I mean, I was already kind of radicalizing before the crisis. I've talked about this often. There was one Austrian in particular, Kurt Rickebacher, Agora Financial, used to publish his newsletters. And I learned so much from reading him. But then when the crisis happened and seeing how the government basically just used it as an opportunity to raid the treasury and redistribute wealth, it kind and of that's ra what it happened, radicalized. Yes. It, and so that's super true, right? And that's just the reality. And it radicalized me. And as was on full display with Capital Account, I think, you know, the kind of the way that we approached the the subject, we really skewered a lot of the bankers by name in some cases, were very critical of central banks. I had even brought on the vice chairman of the Fed, Alan Blinder under Greenspan, and among other things, asked him point blank, why do we need a central bank? And in fact, I asked this question of Claudio Borio recently, the head of the Monetary and Economic Department, the BIS, and I got a similarly sort of unsatisfying answer to that question. I think the reason, although he was sort of more direct in his response than Alan Blinder was, Alan Blinder said that, you guys said, why can't we have what we had during the free banking era? And he said, well, you know, the, it was called wildcat banking because wildcats are wild. That was his answer. It stuck with me always. 
But you know, well, Borio that said say much. no. It doesn't say much. <laughs> and Borio's response was, "It's largely conventional." And I think that that's a much more honest, fair sort of response. But my views have become what more. What does that mean? It's largely conventional. I think what it's it means just, is it that just is. Yeah, so I think it it, is. exactly. I think it's there's a convention <laughs> of policymakers, of technocrats, of people who have high degrees and have studied this stuff. We know what's best, you know, and and right. it's, it's safer think they to let know us. How to run your life yeah. better than you do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's a different story. But in terms of setting monetary policy, I happen to think, Mike, that there is a case to be made for having central banks managing seasonal li- periods of seasonal illiquidity and acting as a backstop. Granted, we can debate that because there are inherent risks to that, right? But the point about setting the price of money has never made sense to me. And I think that was sort of my question to Claudio. A- in any case, I think my larger point here is that I have a more nuanced view of this stuff today than I did. But like, just to bring it back to something you were saying about blockchain and Hashgraph, again, even there, I think when the internet began, the visions of it were very utopian, right? But the societies evolve, economies change, things that we couldn't foresee occur. And the internet has centralized. It's centralized primarily on the software side. You know, net neutrality is an attempt to address what's going on on the telecommunications layer, but the actual software is a place where there's been tremendous amounts of centralization. So companies like Google have a huge amount of power, right? right? So here we have the government and we're used to thinking about the government as being a source of evil, which is enshrined in our constitution. It was the subject of the Federalist Papers of the back and forth between the founding fathers and the conversations they had, but they could not have foreseen where we are today. No. And I think that corporations, these enormous multinational corporations, represent just as serious a threat to liberty as the government does. Absolutely. Okay, so here's a question for you, right? The world that I think you and I would like to live in is a a libertarian utopia that maybe was possible during the late 1700s, early 1800s. Right. Mm-hmm. Since we've gone through multiple industrial revolutions, there's way more population. Technology has empowered the individual to such an extent that an individual terrorist acting alone can attack a hospital, which has very shitty, crappy security and, mm-hmm. you know, kill people. Right. And increasingly, there are people that could argue that we could get to a place where a handful of engineers could create artificial intelligence that could destroy the world. So how do we manage that reality? We live in a new world where individuals that are so powerful that allowing for the kind of individual liberties that I know that you and I both value can lead to the destruction of the human race. I don't know if you even agree with that, so I'm putting it out. Oh, I absolutely do. Since 2009, I've been giving presentations of the death of the global dollar standard. The world has had a new monetary system every so often. I mean, before World War I, we had the classical gold standard. Then we had the gold exchange standard between the wars and then the Bretton Woods system from 44 to 71. This is the most poorly designed system that we're on right now, the global dollar standard. And it's the longest lived of these systems. And, you know, I was showing the cracks that were developing in the global dollar standard. And it began with Saddam Hussein selling oil in euros, but it's speeding up and speeding up and speeding up. When I saw the announcement of Libra on Facebook, now there is like a plot to rule the world Mm. (laughs) by one guy. If you have about half the world's population as customers, you know, The U.S. has 330 million people, and here you're talking about 3.3 billion people that could adopt the Libra currency, and then you've got control over that currency. This is one of the... I just don't like fiat currencies because it does give governments control over us. But also, in this case, a government isn't the only one that theoretically could issue a fiat currency. Obviously, the whole... Traditionally, it is a government, but is that where you're going? You're saying that Libra would be a fiat currency. Because it's not, well, it wouldn't be a cryptocurrency. It's not, yeah. At least not at, I, at I don't the know. Beginning. I didn't read their whole paper. Well, they don't really have. Uh, what I read like was really uh, got... the Senate's request for them to have a moratorium on development because the U.S. government is, for the first time, shaking in their boots over a privately developed currency. Right. You know, I didn't know what the death of the dollar global dollar standard would look like, but 
we've been weaponizing the dollar and using it to sort of bash other countries over the head with. I mean, to use it against North Korea or you know one country or another, that's okay. But when you start doing this on a regular basis, then other countries want to abandon the dollar. And now we've got Europe being able to deal directly with, they've developed a payment system for the Euro that bypasses SWIFT, which uses mm -hmm. US dollars. So they can deal directly with, with Iran, Iran if yeah. they want to. Exactly. And Russia has developed a payment system for with China. Mm -hmm. And there's now futures for yuan and rubles in China and Russia. So you can hedge contracts and be able to make a purchase today of something that you won't have to pay for for six months and know what the price is going to be mm. by neutralizing the exchange rates. So one after another after another, and today the nails in the coffin are coming at the rate of several per week. It used to be that there'd be something and I would comment on it and then six months later there would be something else. But now it's like I read the news and I go, oh my God, people just don't realize how quickly this is falling mm. apart. And with the next crisis, the next crisis should be something absolutely enormous because, you know, one of the things, there's a term that I helped to spread initially where I called this the everything bubble. And that's actually incorrect. We're not in the everything bubble. And in my new book, I call it the almost everything bubble. Bubble is when something runs ahead of the rest of the economy and the economy becomes warped. If the entire economy is growing <laughs> at the same pace, nothing is in a bubble. It's all balanced. If wages and real estate and asset prices and the price of food and gasoline and everything goes up at the same rate, that's just the value of the currency going down. Well, that's basically. hyperinflation. Yeah, but- That's what every, you're describing. Well, no, not necessarily. Whenever an economy grows, things growing at the same rate, when it's growth that introduces instability, that's one sector growing faster than the others. It's warped. And that sector, the stock market or real estate, usually it's an asset where, you know, if you lower interest rates real, real low, you push real estate into an asset because it's so real estate's interest rate sensitive. If you create a bunch of currency and give it to the big brokerage houses like Ben Bernanke did, you create a stock market bubble. When something grows a whole lot faster than the economy, over a period of time, now you've got a warped economy where once, and the, the market is always trying to set these things in balance. So sometime or another, some event will cause this thing to break. They say that it's a crisis, that the free market isn't working. No, the free market is working. It's overwhelming their manipulations. And the greatest manipulations in history took place with the crisis of 2008. And now we're still pushing on this string trying to get the economy to go, and we're starting to cut interest rates ahead of a crisis here and stave it off. We started this administration with tax cuts at the end of the longest economic expansion in history. You know, we're doing tax cuts when there's something inevitable, which means you have less ammo once it does happen. So I think we're in for one huge crisis here. It's gonna be bigger than 2008 because the greater the manipulation, the greater the release of energy when the crisis finally arrives. And so this isn't the everything bubble, it's the almost everything bubble because they have pushed stocks back into a huge bubble. They've pushed real estate into a bubble only in the areas that are affected by those stocks. When they raised the stock market and caused this wealth transfer to the FANG stocks, Seattle real estate where Amazon is and all of Silicon Valley, any area that is heavily affected by the stock market is where the real estate bubbles are. So that's going to be crashing and so will bonds because we're in the longest bull market in history with bonds and they've pushed that into a bubble by cutting rates down to, you know, that's a manipulated So we do live, bubble. there's no question. By the way, yeah. doesn't 0% interest rates and negative interest rates, something that was not a concept until 2008, negative interest rates, where that rates weren't a concept. And we've had them now since 2008. Doesn't that say to you that the emergency never ended? You're saying we have them in the United States in real terms. In real terms, but in Europe. About okay. a quarter of all the world's sovereign debt is negative right yeah. now. So doesn't that say that if any country anywhere on the planet is still issuing negative yielding bonds, doesn't that say to you that there's still an emergency? I think, first of all, I don't know what it says to me anymore. The, the real answer is, I don't know anymore. I've lost my compass. 
I think, I think, I, I think all that's caused by the Keynesians, though. If the market was doing this, the market could never set a negative interest rate. It just won't happen. Right. Well, I mean, I think, for example, the point about negative interest rates also, though, reflects this gross wealth distribution, right? Because you've got a very small number of people that own a huge amount of the liabilities. Right. And so for them to get a return on their investment, first of all, they're out competing each other. So they're driving yields down. And also, yields need to be low enough to maintain the crop yield. Right. In other words, like to maintain the crop. In other words, my point is that they've managed this enormous wealth transfer in part by generating so much debt. And the accommodative monetary policy is part of that process. So I guess what I'm, you know, trying to come back to again is that. I don't view it as just an issue of monetary policy like I used to. I don't see it as simply monetary policy. I see it as part of a much larger story. And I think what's at the center of it is the private sector debt and the private sector debt as a mechanism for transferring wealth, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's not sustainable, that we don't have an ownership economy anymore. Where there's a huge chunk of America that doesn't have a piece right. of the country. And how is that supposed to work, basically? Right? I mean, like you grew up in a different world, right? Like yeah. the world that you grew up in, there was a middle class. There is not a middle class today. And I just think we've gotten so used to it that, that we I don't. Think, you know, we do have a middle class, but the most of the middle class has a negative net worth. But when I, you know, walk the streets of New well, they're York not middle here, class. I see point, a though. whole lot of people driving BMWs and Mercedes and they're, yeah, they're on their a, cell phones yeah. and all that kind of stuff. And so, you know... It's interesting. People talk about the poor and that it, when anybody says the rich get richer and the poor get poorer, that's not true. Around the world, people are coming out of poverty quicker than at any time in history. And this is just data. When you adjust things for inflation, the people that are living on a dollar a day, for instance, or $10 a day, there's fewer and fewer of those people every year at a rate that has, you know, we're reducing poverty around the world. A poor person today is poor, but they have cable TV and a cell phone, possibly an iPad. <laughs> so we're running up against the hour, Mike. I want to shift and make sure we get to cover Tesla because I know that you and I don't share the same views on Tesla or Elon, and this would be a good opportunity for listeners to get an alternate take. We're going to move it now to the overtime for regular listeners. You know the drill. If you're new to the program or if you haven't subscribed yet, to one of our three Patreon subscriptions. You can do so now by going into the description section of this podcast and clicking on the Patreon link, which will send you to patreon.com slash hidden forces, where you can sign up to one of our three subscription tiers. The audio file gives you access to the overtime, every overtime we've ever done, as well as a RSS link that you can include in your favorite podcasting application so you can hear the overtime just like you hear the regular podcast. Autodidact subscribers get access to that, plus all of our transcripts going back to episode one. And super nerd subscribers get access to our rundowns, which are these multi-page, beautiful documents full of links, pictures, and reference material that I use in preparation for the episode. This week's episode doesn't have a rundown, but all our prior episodes do. And you can sign up to that again at patreon.com slash hidden forces. Mike? Stick around, we'll be right back. Today's episode of Hidden Forces was recorded at Creative Media Design Studio in New York City. For more information about this week's episode, or if you want easy access to related programming, visit our website at hiddenforces.io and subscribe to our free email list. If you want access to overtime segments, episode transcripts, and show rundowns full of links and detailed information related to each and every episode, check out our premium subscription available through the Hidden Forces website or through our Patreon page at patreon.com slash hidden forces. Today's episode was produced by me and edited by Stylianos Nicolaou. For more episodes, you can check out our website at hiddenforces.io. Join the conversation at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hidden Forces Pod, or send me an email at dk at hiddenforces.io. As always, thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.